This is a video on measuring time. I'm going to cover the origin and history of the calendar, the Gregorian calendar, and calculating the day of the week for a given date. I'll go through the derivation of the formula, the algorithm, how that's actually done. I'll look very briefly at some other calendars and a little bit of the arithmetic of converting between units of time, like minutes, hours, and seconds, and decimal. So mathematics and measuring time. Mathematics is a kind of invisible universe. We all follow the rules of this invisible mathematical universe whether we know those rules or not. And similarly, we all follow the mathematical rules of the calendar and in the conventions of time measurement. We all follow those rules 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and about 365 days per year whether we know those rules or not. This video is about uncovering hidden rules that govern our lives, in this case specific to the calendar and time measurement. Discovering, discovering the hidden rules of the universe is fundamentally what mathematics is all about. We'll start here with understanding how the calendar works and how it developed, sometime in the last second of the cosmic calendar. If we mapped all of the history of just the Earth, all of geologic time, all onto a single 24-hour day, we would see humans arrive in the last minute of that day. The earliest known calendar may be a set of pits thought to correspond to lunar phases, found at a place known, war, as, known as Warren Field, in Scotland dating to about 8000 BC from the period known as the Neolithic Age. Written calendars developed about 5000 years ago in about 3000 BC and our discussion of history must reference the birth of Christ because Christianity has had such an ins a significant role in the development of the modern calendar. B.C. refers to dates before the birth of Christ, and A.C. refers to dates after the birth of Christ. However, it's more common to use the abbreviation A.D., which stands for Anno Domini, Latin for the year of our Lord, and it was a Christian monk in the Middle Ages that began this number scheme. Dates are also sometimes referred to the abbrevi with the abbreviation C.E., or, uh, which stands for either Common Era or Christian Era. So we have the first century AD in those 100 years from the year 1 until the year 100. And the first century BC from the year 1 BC to the year 100 BC or BCE. And so the second century is from the year 101 AD until the year 200, those 100 years. The 19th century is those hundred years from 1801 to 1900 and the 20th century was from 1901 to 2000. So really the year 2000 was in the 20th century and the year 2001 that's in the 21st century because the 21st century is those 100 years from 2001 to 2100 and then the 22nd century begins in 2101. Now our modern calendar evolved from the ancient Babylonian and ancient Egyptian calendars which existed about 5,000 years ago, around 3000 BC. The Babylonian calendar was copied and modified by the ancient Greeks, but then copied and modified again by the ancient Romans creating what's now called the Julian calendar around 44 BC. The ancient Roman calendar was then adopted by the early Christians and used through the Middle Ages till it was eventually modified again in 1582 when it finally became the modern calendar. The ancient Babylonian calendar was based on the moon with holy days at each quarter in the moon cycle. 
these holy days occurred about every seven days, so seven became a mystical number. There were seven wanderers of the sky the ancients watched. This is where the word planet actually comes from, and each was associated with a god. This formed the seven days of the week. Sunday represented the sun's day, and Monday was the moon's day, or the god associated with the moon. And Tuesday, in English, derives from Tuesday, which was a Viking name for Mars, because English is also has origins in the Norse language, which was the language of the, the Vikings. Wednesday, in English, comes from Woden's Day, and Woden was a Viking name for Mercury. Thursday comes from Thor's Day, which was a Viking name for Jupiter. Friday from Frigg's, na uh, Frigg's Day, which is a Viking name for Venus. And Saturday comes from Saturn's Day. Languages with Latin or Roman roots still retain the connections between the days of the week and the names of the planets and gods to which they correspond. You can see how Lundi and Lunes and Lunedi in Italian is corresponds to the same word that we have in English for lunar. You can see in French, Spanish, and Italian how Mars is a part of the name for that day of the week. And similarly with uh, Wednesday in French and Spanish and Italian, they still have a close association with the uh, planet Mercury. There are Roman origins for the names of the months. And the earliest Roman calendar was actually 10 months long with extra days added periodically. It then evolved to a 12-month calendar. Thousands of years ago, the Babylonians observed that the constellations in which the sun rose each morning changed during the year. Measurements by Hipparchus, an ancient Greek astronomer in 130 BC, identified dates for each constellation, and these are the familiar dates for each sign in the zodiac. But even 2,000 years ago, Hipparchus recognized that the axis of rotation of the Earth was itself rotating like a spinning top. This is now called the precession of the equinoxes, and it's an approximately 26,000 year cycle. Because of this wobble in the direction of the Earth's axis of rotation, the constellations in which the sun rises at different times of the year gradually changes over a period of thousands of years. Hipparchus knew about this effect thousands of years ago. While he measured the dates of the zodiac in 130 BC, he could have also predicted the dates for the zodiac as they occur today, and how they would have changed from his time. Many people even today don't know or understand this, instead misled by the nonsense of astrology. Mathematics and science can reveal the true nature of those rules which govern everyone and everything, I would say, like a, an antidote to fake news. Below are the current dates for the signs of the zodiac. These are based on actual science, astronomy, not astrology. The dates indicate constellations in which the sun rises during the year based on current observations. These dates differ from those original familiar dates because of that precession of the equinox, that 26,000 year wobble in the axis of rotation of the Earth. It takes approximately 365.242 days for the Earth to orbit the Sun and about 29.531 days for the Moon 
to orbit the Earth. Our calendar became what it is today because these numbers are not exact integers. Our modern calendar originated from both the moon-based lunar calendar of the Babylonians, the word month comes from the word for moon, and the sun-based calendar of the Egyptians. Both influences were combined into the ancient Roman calendar, which became the early Christian calendar, and then the Catholic calendar, and then the modern calendar used by everyone in the world. Julius Caesar modified that Roman calendar in about 44 BC. Before Caesar, the ancient Roman calendar had 10 months based on lunar cycles, and each and extra days were added in a haphazard way during the year to keep in sync with the seasons. And it was complicated and confusing and badly in need of improvement. Politicians would add days or weeks as they saw fit to keep the calendar in sync with the seasons and also for religious and financial and political reasons. 2,000 years ago, Caesar spends time in Egypt and falls in love with Cleopatra. He learns of the Egyptian estimate for the length of the year at 365 days plus 6 hours. That would be 365.25 days. And after returning to Rome, Caesar decrees a new calendar with 12 months and leap years every four years. And this is now called the Julian calendar, and it is still in use thousands of years later, but it is not actually our modern calendar. The year that Caesar introduced his new calendar was called the Year of Confusion. I think I've had a few of those years of confusion myself. I know what that would be like. In the Julian calendar, three years of 365 days are followed by one year of 366 days, the leap year. So if you added up the total number of year, uh, days over a four-year period, 1,461 days in a four-year period, you can see that it averages out to 365.25 days per year average every four years and therefore going forward the average length of the calendar is 365.25 days. This is closer to the actual time it takes the Earth to orbit the Sun. The actual time for the Earth to orbit the Sun is a little less. It's about 365.242 days. That small error was finally corrected about 1500 years after Julius Caesar in about 1582 with the modern Gregorian calendar. The Roman calendar became the Christian calendar and spread through Europe in the Middle Ages. And the primary reason for improving after the Roman calendar was religious. The Christian monks of the Middle Ages were trying to establish the correct date for Easter, which was based on both cycles of the moon and the sun. In 325 AD, the Christian Council of Nicaea established that Easter would be held on the first Sunday after the first full moon occurring on or after the March equinox. Computus refers to the calculation of the Easter date, which was a continuing challenge for Christian monks through the Middle Ages. A Christian monk named Dionysius was calculating dates for Easter for 100 years into the future during the Middle Ages. He decided to start numbering years from the birth of Christ. And he estimated that Christ's birth had been 525 years earlier. And he may have been off by about four years. Thus, Dionysius decided that it was the year 525 AD. And that estimate caught on. It is the same numbering system the entire world now uses. At the time of Dionysius, Romans were counting the years from the last Roman emperor Diocletian who had lived 200 years before. Because Diocletian had persecuted Christians, Dionysius wanted to change the numbering for the years and began numbering the years Anno Domini or AD and that was Latin for the year of our Lord. Dionysius counted the year before Christ as 1 BC and the year after as 1 AD and he did not count a year zero probably because there was no symbol for zero among the Roman numerals that he used at the time. 
Dionysius numbering and the Julian calendar lasted for about a thousand years in Europe, but it was still based on a leap year every four years for an average of 365.25 days per year, and while that is pretty accurate, after a thousand years the date of the spring equinox had moved about 10 days earlier in the calendar. That is, the calendar was running a little too fast compared to the time the Earth actually takes to orbit the Sun, which you could call the solar year. Besides determining the date of Easter, there were other obvious reasons for improving the calendar, such as predicting seasonal changes for agriculture, and another important reason would soon begin to develop. Navigating across the oceans depended on accurate measurements of the sun's elevation in the sky, which changed during the year. The Gregorian calendar becomes the official calendar in 1582 AD in the Catholic Church, named after the Pope at the time, Pope Gregory the Thirteenth. Three leap years are removed every 400 years and 10 days are skipped in October of 1582 to realign the calendar with the seasons and the intended date of Easter. This calendar was first adopted by Catholics in Italy Spain and France and other parts of Europe, but not by Protestants, and eventually Germany accepted the Gregorian calendar in 1775, Great Britain and the American colonies in 1752, Japan in 1873, Russia in 1917, China in 1949. So the Gregorian calendar was the same as the Julian calendar, except for those 10 days skipped in October of 1582, and then it followed a modified leap year rule said, in the Gregorian calendar, we'll have leap years every four years, except not on century years, except if the century year is divisible by 400. So with this scheme, the length of the calendar year is reduced slightly to 365.2425 days per year on average. And as a result, the Gregorian calendar is completing a four 400 year cycle. It takes 400 years to complete a cycle. For example, starting in the year 1600, which was a leap year, since it's divisible by 400, this would then be followed by leap years every four years except not 1700, it's a century year, but then leap years every four years again, but not 1800, another century year, and then every four years again, there are leap years, but then not 1900, another century year, and then every four years again, but then the year 2000 was a leap year because it was again divisible by 400. So this pattern makes three years, those century years of 1700, 1800, 1900 become non-leap years that would have otherwise in the old Julian calendar had been leap years and though therefore this uh, thus in a 400 year period there are only 97 leap years and 303 non-leap years. So you can calculate the average length of the calendar year in the Gregorian calendar by adding up 303 years that are all 365 days and 97 years that are 366. The total number of days divided by 400 years gives you a slightly lower average than before. It's now 365.2425 rather than 365.25. But the current length of a year based an actual year based on the actual time that it actually takes the Earth to orbit the Sun, a what's called a solar year, that's about 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45 seconds currently. And that works out to be about 365.2422 days, which is a little slower than the Gregorian calendar average of 365.2425 days. And even further, the Earth is slowing down in its orbit about a half a second every 100 years. 2,000 years ago, the Earth orbited the Sun about 10 seconds faster than it does now. Because the Earth is slowing down in its orbit, the Gregorian calendar is not only a little fast at 365.2425 days on average, it just can't be made to be forever exactly perfect. 
in the year 4909 AD, the Gregorian calendar will be one day ahead of the true solar calendar. For dates in the 1500s to 1700s AD in Europe, to be precise, one must be careful to distinguish between the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar for certain events. We'll now derive an algorithm to, to, to determine the day of the week for any date, but is really valid only for the Gregorian calendar and therefore really only after 1582. Nevertheless, any date can be used in the following algorithm. Well, any date from zero anywhere into the future, from the year zero anywhere into the future. Using dates before 1582 is equivalent to determining the day of the week such a date would have occurred if the current Gregorian calendar had been in use all the way back to some theoretical year zero. The algorithm will be will determine the day of the week for any date in the future also assuming the Gregorian calendar continues in use. So here's the algorithm. We're going to be given a year Y, a month M, and a day D, and we'll look at this procedure to determine the day of the week by understanding how the calendar works. First you're going to calculate this J function. and I'll explain where this comes from a little bit later, but that's the first step is to determine for each month, M is the month, which of these values to use. And then we're going to calculate this G function, which depends on the year. We have this little detail that if it's a January or February month that we're using, we have to use the pr prior year in this calculation. Those little brackets are significant. What they do is uh, make us uh, round every decimal value down. Even if you had a 0.9 in the decimal, you round it down. And the last step is to calculate n, which is the day of the week, you adding the day that we had plus the j value we had plus the g value we have and then dividing by 7. That mod 7 means you get just the remainder when you divide by 7 and if you get 0 remainder, it was a Sunday, a 1 remainder is Monday, 2 for Tuesday, 3 for Wednesday, etc. up to 6 for Saturday. So let's do an example here. What day of the week was July 19th, 1969? So for July 19, 1969, the month is 7, the day is 19, the year is 1969, and we have to look up what's J for 7. And on that table, J for 7 was 5. So that's the first step. The second step is to take the year 1969 and add 1969 plus 1969 divided by 4 but round it down 1969 divided by 100 round that down and subtract and then 1969 divided by 400 round that down each of those would actually give you a decimal which I'm like this would have been 4.92 I need to round it down to 4 not rounding normally but rounding down that's very important here if you had added all the decimal values first, you'd get a larger value, which then rounded down wouldn't give you the same result, and the whole thing doesn't work. So you have to round them all down individually first, combine, and then proceed. So we'll take the day, which was the 19th, the J value for the month, which is 5, and then the 2446 that we had calculated in step 2. Add them all together, that's 2470. Take 2470 and divide by 7, but you have to do the actual long division and actually get the remainder. The remainder is 6. 6 is a Saturday. So July 19, 1969 was a Saturday. So now I want to go through and explain how that algorithm worked. So to understand, you have to first recognize that 400 year cycle in the Gregorian calendar. So if we look at the calendar from the year 2000, it would be the same as the calendar for a theoretical year zero, if we imagine extending the calendar back 2,000 years. Because the calendar repeats every 400 years, the year zero, 400, 800, 1200, 1600, and 2000, they're all, or they would have, been the same. So extending the Gregorian calendar backwards to a time before it even existed is called the proleptic Gregorian calendar. So if we look at 
January 1st for the year 2000. That was a Saturday, so I would say that if we had continued with this calendar ever since a theoretical year zero, that January 1st in year zero, that would have been a Saturday as well. We'll use the year zero as a base from which we can determine the day of the week for any other date after the year zero. So the year 2000 was a leap year, according to the Gregorian calendar, and thus year zero would also have been a leap year. And so looking at year 2000, February 29th, that was a Tuesday. So February 29th of the year zero, that was also a Tuesday. And the most complicated issue in this algorithm is the leap year adjustments. So to accommodate this, we'll have to start counting added days from previous months. We're going to start counting on March 1st, and then we'll add days for January and February from the previous year. And we'll also work with the fact that four weeks of seven days makes 28 days. We'll need to know how many days over 28 occur each month, and those extra days move the day of the week forward in following months. You also have to recognize 52 weeks of seven days actually makes 364 days. And so for a year of 365 days, each year would complete 52 weeks plus one day. And thus the end, uh, and thus each year ends on the same day of the week on which it began. So for consecutive years of 365 days, the following year will begin on the day of the week following that day on which the previous year had begun. For example, the year 2018, which is not a leap year, began on a Monday, and it ends on a Monday, as the 2019 will begin on a Tuesday. However, for leap years, an extra day is added, so we're going to advance one further day in the week at the start of a new year after leap years. So together this means there are really only 14 possible calendar configurations, one for each day of the week as it continues to advance through the week, one day later each year for those non-leap years that occur consecutively. Uh, and there's one possible calendar for uh, each day of the week but with a leap year. So there are 14 total possible different calendars that could occur. A curious result of this is that they don't all occur as many times as each other. So um, in a 400 year Gregorian calendar cycle, the 13th of each month is slightly more likely to be on a Friday, just slightly, than it would occur on any other day of the week. So February 29 of the year 2000 was a Tuesday, and March 1st of 2000, that was a Wednesday. And because 2000 was a leap year, we're going to set March 1 of year 0 as a Wednesday to match March 1 of 2000. And so we're going to begin the algorithm derivation by setting J for the month of March to a 2. And that way the calculation for March 1st in year 0 will work out right. The day, March 1st, day is 1. J of M, when the month is 3, that has to be 2. It has to be 2 so that when you calculate G for the year 0, you get 3, and 3 mod 7 is still 3, and 3 means Wednesday. And March 3rd in the year 0 would have had to have been a Wednesday if we extend our calendar all the way back to year 0. So as we look through the year, each month, and how many days each month has, you'll see how I'm deriving each of these values for this J function. I'm sort of essentially starting counting in March so that I can add the leap year separately in my algorithm. And so, for example, this two sort of had to be fixed all because I know what the year zero has to be based on knowing what the year 2000 was like. And so when we get through all of April, 
and I look back at March being 31 days and say, well, I had three days extra in March that moved me over in April. Uh, and so I'm going to add three, pl two plus three, the two that I had already, plus three, that gives me five, and five mod seven is still five. So then when I look at May, I'm going to say, well, May, in May, following April, April had 30 days, and that's two extra. So what I'm going to do is I'll say 5 plus the 2, that gives me 7. 7 mod 7 is 0, 0 remainder, right? And then when I hit June, any date in June follows May, which had 31 days, which is 3 extra more than 28. And 0 plus 3, 0 here, plus 3 gives me 3, and 3 mod 7, that's 3. Right? 3 plus 2 gives me 5, and 5 mod five, 7 is 5. So then let's say, for example, August, looking back at July, that's 31 days. That's an extra three days added on from what I already had in July. So 5 plus 3, that makes 8. But 8 is really 1 when you divide out the 7, because there's a remainder of 1. And it continues like that. So let's re return to the algorithm. These are the values that I just demonstrated by looking at sort of the variations through the months in the number of days each month. And then that second step is going to add a day to the week for every year from year zero. And then add another one if it was a leap year. But then it subtracts it for each of the century years that occur, but then we put it back if that century year happened to be divisible by 400. And then we add all those numbers together, divide by 7, and find out the day of the week. So let's do another example. How about January 2nd in the year 3? 1, 2, 3. So the month is 1, the day is 2, the year is 3. So J of 1, looking on the table. J of 1 is 0. Now the year, I'm going to take the 2 days for uh, following 2. Oh, yeah, right. So we're in the year 3, but we're doing a January date. So we have to subtract 1 from the year. So we'll take 2, 2 divided by 4, 2 divided by 100, 2 divided by 400. Each of these is a fraction that when you round it down you get 0. So we get plus 2. So we take the j value and the day and the year. 2 plus 2, that's 4, and 4 mod 7, that's still 4, and that's a Thursday. It's kind of fitting that the January 2nd, the year 3, would be day 4 in my formula. It's a Thursday, and you could check to see, just like the year 3, the year 2003, January 2nd in the year 2003, to confirm that this is right, um, that was a Thursday. Let's do another example. October 25th, 1811, the birth of Everest Galois. That's the month 10, day 25, year 1811. So look up J for 10, and you get a 6. Now calculate for 1811. Now we're doing October, so we don't have to subtract one for the year. Um, so in other words, what's happened is if you're in October, you've already picked up uh, the necessary, you've already picked up any leap years in that, in that year, so I don't have to subtract one, right? if it had been. Right? So um, 1811, that's one day for every year. Right? And then one day for every leap year. And then minus 18 days for each of those century years, but put back four because there were four times that we had a year divisible by 400. Add the 6, the 25, the 2249, divide by 7, you get a 5, and it was a Friday. I should say you get a 5 as the remainder, and so that means Friday. And so Everest Galois born October 25th, 1811. He was born on a Friday. Now the ancient Babylonians used a base 60 number system and fractions were also base 60. A whole could be divided into 60 parts and each part could be further divided into 60 parts. And in medieval Europe, that is from about 400 AD to 1400 AD, these divisions were very were referred to as the pars minuta prima or the pars minuta secunda in Latin from which we derive the words minute and second. So the idea of using decimals for fractional amounts as we do today did not really start until the 1500s. 
So I'll give an example where we convert a fraction of an hour written in decimal into the ancient base 60 Babylonian fraction of hours and minutes and seconds. It's just amazing to think about that when we tell time in hours and minutes and seconds, at least when we refer to minutes and seconds, we're looking at base 60 Babylonian fractions. So a time like 4 hours, 54 minutes, 35 seconds, we can take those base 60 fractions that are ancient Babylonian fractions, ways of measuring parts, and convert it to a method of decimal, a decimal method of uh, measuring a fraction that is thousands of years later. So when we look at 5.823 hours, that would convert to 4 hours, 49 minutes, and 23 seconds. And the way I convert that is to take that fraction of an hour at 0.823 hours, that's less than an hour, and I convert that, I use a conversion factor here, cancel the units of hours, and multiply 0.823 times 60, and that gives me 49.38 minutes. But that 0.38 minutes, that's a decimal fraction of a minute. It's not how many seconds we have. We take that fraction of a minute, that 0.38 minutes, multiply another conversion factor, cancels minutes, so we have 0.38 times 60, and that's 22.8 seconds. Now you could either say that it's 22.8 seconds and be accurate or round it up to the nearest second and say it's about 23 seconds there. So converting the other way, if I had 4 hours and 54 minutes and 35 seconds, that translates to 4.90972 hours in the decimal system. And the way I do that is I take that 54 minute fraction of an hour and multiply by a conversion factor that cancels the units of minutes. But in this case, I have to do 54 divided by 60. So you can see the base 60 fraction right there. That's 0 0.9 in decimal. So, it's, so 54 minutes represents 0 0.9 hours. And that 35 additional seconds that's measured can, can be converted into hours by doing two steps conversions. The seconds cancel here to minutes, but the minutes cancel into hours. So this is another base 60 fraction. And 35 divided by 60 squared, that's about 0 0.00972 repeating. Uh, it's got a repeating part because it's a rational number. We add those two decimal values together, rounding off, you get about 4.90972 hours. Let's take another example. Earth currently takes 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45 seconds to complete an orbit around the sun. So let's put that in decimal. Take the 5 hours, convert that into days, another conversion factor. The 48 minutes, and convert that into days. Two conversion factors. Make sure that the units cancel out. Minutes cancel, hours cancel. The unit that remains is days. So 48 over 60 times 24, that's 0.03 repeating, days. Those 45 seconds multiplying by three conversion factors to convert it into days. Seconds cancel, minutes cancel, hours cancel, the units are left as days. 45 divided by 60 squared times 24, all in the denominator there. 0 0.00052083 repeating days. Add all those two, all those three different you see, you, you couldn't add 5 hours plus 48 minutes plus 45 seconds just by adding 5 plus 48 plus 45. We need to convert them all into days if we want to add them. So that's what I've done here. Now I can add this, these different fractions of a day together. And if I add them very uh, carefully to, to not have any rounding errors, I get 0.2421875 days can round that off here to say that the actual time that it takes the Earth to go around the Sun is about 365.2422 days, a little bit less than the actual average in the Gregorian calendar. That was, two, that was 0.2425, as you recall. So let's look at uh, year 28. 
15 in other calendars, which depending on the month is the year 67, 68 in uh, an Assyrian calendar, which is uh, related to the ancient Babylonian calendar, 5779 in the Hebrew calendar, 1440 in the Islamic calendar. It's kind of neat to look at the Mayan, the ancient Mayan calendar, which turned over in the year 2012, but now is at 13.05117 in the Mayan system of numbering. 2562 on the Buddhist calendar, 4655 the year of the dog on the Chinese calendar. Here's a Thai Buddhist calendar from 2012 that shows the year in the Buddhist calendar, 2555 then, the month of Tevet in the year 5778 on the Hebrew lunar calendar is shown here. Months are on lunar calendars are either going to be 29 or 30 days because the orbit of the moon around the Earth takes 29.5 days about. So to match the period of the moon's orbit, some months are 29, some months are 30. You can see this month was 29. It sort of coincides with the end of 2017 and the beginning of 2018. Here's the year 1433 on the Islamic calendar. It was during 2011 on the Gregorian calendar. Both November and December matched this lunar month. Notice also a 29 month a 29 day month on uh, on this lunar calendar that sort of matches some of November and some of December. Ends on December 25th in this particular example. And it's also kind of interesting to see the Eastern Arabic numbers there next to the Western Arabic uh, numbers that we use. So in the ancient world, time was measured with sundials and hourglasses and water clocks. The first mechanical clocks appear in China around the year 1000 AD in Europe, around 1200 AD. And accurate clocks became important in determining longitude for navigation in the 1700s. Clocks are still used for navigation. Now they are super accurate atomic clocks that are used in the GPS calculations. Most modern, most accurate modern clocks are the atomic clocks. As of 2010, the NIST F1 has an uncertainty measured to within 3 times 10 to the negative 16 seconds. It's expected to neither gain nor lose a second in more than 20 million years. Atomic clocks are used for satellites, it's used uh, by satellites for GPS, for internet communication, for many science applications like physics and astronomy. Yeah, the difference in the speed of time from the differences in gravity at altitudes of the GPS satellites requires using Einstein's theory of relativity in the GPS calculation. And it's kind of neat to see the newton rapson method, among other methods, that's taught in Calc 1 in the calculations for the GPS. And it's amazing, but if that theory of relativity had not been accounted for in those calculations, GPS would accumulate errors at a rate of 5 miles per day. So it would be completely useless. The pure theoretical idea of relativity turns out to be fundamentally applicable, critical, in the um, GPS calculations that we use every day. And it's those super accurate atomic clocks that you might think, why would you ever need to have a clock so accurate? But it's because of the calculations, the, the precision that's required to adjust for those relativistic effects um, that require an atomic clock to be able to make GPS work. So that s high level of accuracy is in measuring time is required for something that we use uh, and take for granted every day. In, uh, in our GPS when we want to figure out how to get to a new restaurant we look it up on the phone it's uh, those atomic clocks that make it possible okay that's the end of the video thank you very much for watching one of my uh, very uh, primary sources for a lot of this was this book calendar 
uh, humanity's epic struggle to determine a true and accurate year by David Ewing Duncan, which you can find on Amazon. Also, really appreciate. I really enjoyed the Strange History of the Calendar by Daniel Seehausen, which you can find also on YouTube. And a lot of this you can study if you look up Zeller's Congruence on Wikipedia and other websites.